All right, everyone. So as you already know, I'm Jose Gregory, and I've been teaching AP U.S. History for 13 years. But in addition to that, I've also taught accelerated or honors U.S. History in Georgia Studies. So what I'm going to present to you now in this section, it's really how to use the art and incorporate that into the classroom. But I want to make sure that we are aware that it's not just for AP kids. This is something that we can do and should do with the on-level students as well if we really focus not only on the content but on the skills that are transferable. So it's really important that you know we keep an open mind to it. The other thing that I want to point out is that I use creative projects in the classroom because I've worked at a school for the performing arts for the last eight years and because I'm really trying to um, speak the language that will resonate with my students. I have been known in the past for eulogizing history, so I really don't want to continue doing that with the kids. I want them to actually do something. So we're actually going to try to create something today during this presentation. And it stems from the work of art that I would like to say that I selected, but it actually kind of like selected me. Um, when I first visited the High Museum, I was overwhelmed by all of the options that I had for U.S. history. I knew that I could find something from the Hudson River School. I saw something that I believe was from the Ashkin School and that I could find something from pop art that I've seen before. And then I stumbled upon this porcelain vase that was in the middle of the room that you all got to see this morning. And immediately it hit me and I started thinking, Hmm, I'm actually hearing voices. It's kind of like that weird commercial when the items start talking to you. And I heard this is a perfect timeline. This is something that you can use for continuity and change. This is something that you can really use to prepare kids for the test. And I've been concerned in the past with thinking that if you're doing this creative projects, it's really not doing history. Like the kids are not going to replicate this on the AP examination. But then I really changed my way of seeing that and realized that those two things are not mutually exclusive. You can actually get them to engage in doing art pieces uh, while still teaching them the content um, and making sure that they are still accurate um, in their understanding of history. So the piece that I selected is a sensory vase created in 1876 by a German-born artist, Carl um, Mueller. And it's really divided into three sections, as you saw this morning. The top part that has thunderbolts, eagles, and stars clearly representing um, the American nation itself. But what I really want to focus on are the other two sections. In the middle, you saw that there were signs of inventions and progress during the first century. And it also had a portrait of George Washington on both sides. And what I already started thinking with that is like, wait, that's a theme. We're talking about technological innovations. There's work, exchange, and technology. There clearly is a nexus between what they actually need to know for the exam and this piece of art. And in the bottom, we have six panels that depict American um, history scenes. And some of them were easier to identify than others. Okay? And there was one in particular that was really challenging um, even for those individuals that worked in the museum, I got a hold of the other museum that has the other uh, vase because there's only two, one here, the other one is in the Brooklyn Museum, and I still couldn't fully um, corroborate the information. I only got one source, um, and that's the one that I asked you about earlier, and I want to see what your theories are in a couple of um, seconds. Um, but that was kind of like something that's still inconclusive. It's kind of like up in the air. The other thing that I want to point out as well is if you notice the animals that really depict um, things that are indigenous to what our country, um, what would become our country, like the bison, the walrus, and rams. Um, and clearly you can see that the bison heads um, that are used as part of the handles. So let's focus on the bottom section first. And how many of you, raise your hand if you were able to identify these two without any difficulty. More likely than not, our kids can do this, right? They may not necessarily know that this is William Penn, but they see that there's some type of treaty between an individual of European ancestry and a Native American. The one on the right, clearly, most of us quickly identified that it was a Boston Tea Party, right? We can see that from individuals dressed like Native Americans and the uh, chest of tea. 
But what I would like the students to do, as I mentioned earlier when we talked about contextualization and synthesis, is not just to identify, but to do what? Explain. Why is this historically significant? So can someone tell me, pick either one, and tell me, we already identified what it is, right? Why do you think this artist would actually select this particular panel as one of the top six things from the um, origins of our country to represent that it's historically significant? Who wants to take this one? What's the significance of this? Why the Boston Tea Party, Becky? The Sons of Liberty, um, okay. you know, showing overt defiance to taxation uh, placed upon them by the uh, uh, government in London. Absolutely. And what I'm trying to point out, and that's an excellent answer, is that whenever you make your kids do any type of creative project, you have to get them to write right, or to have a discussion. You need to get them to go beyond identification and to actually incorporate that into the writing or the classroom discussion. It is not enough that you tell me that I would go ahead and select these 10 items to depict uh, or commemorate the first century of our nation's history, but this is why I would select this particular um, events. Okay, the other two were also fairly straightforward. Most of you got these, right? the revolutionary soldier at the bottom, and a Native American chief. But the last two were really difficult, okay? I'm not gonna click to the other side just yet because I want to see what your theories are. There was one, if you remember, that had what appears to be like a frontiersman in front of a cabin, but there was another one that had two individuals, both wearing hats with different types of trees in the back, and there was a third figure in the middle with like some type of board. And that's the one that I specifically wanted you to th um, think about. So what are your theories? What did you say? You had some type of what? Like a board in the middle, some wooden plank or something like that. Did, I know someone had a theory. They told me that they thought they had figured it out. Remember that making a mistake or giving a wrong answer is just an opportunity to learn. And <laughs> it really is. And I'm not even 100% certain because I only found one source that gave me the answer. Yes, what's okay, your theory? I'm going to take a crack at the, it looked like a um, um, log house, the man with the X. Uh -huh. Okay. Abraham Lincoln, that's choice number one. Okay. Choice number two is just the frontiersman who's going out and like hewing the very uh, rough, you know, um, like it's kind of like the, the everyman. Um, and then choice number three, maybe because I'm AP Lang, would be um, folklore, like, you know, uh, Paul Bunyan, Baby okay. in the Blue Ox, like kind of, or Johnny Appleseed, like homage to that, like American folkloric history. Okay, and I would point out that the second one is correct. Okay, the frontiersman. Oh, okay. okay, so you have the individual that really showing this pioneering spirit and building the log cabins and so forth. What about the other one with the two men and the two different trees and the hats? That's the one that I literally spent weeks trying to find the answer. I harassed the people at the High Museum. Uh, the palm trees. Uh -huh. so it seems to indicate some like, Caribbean influence. Or okay, maybe the tropics, the tropics southern. Tropics and maybe there's some, I'm not sure what's on the platter. Uh -huh. Maybe something um, native to wherever they are. Okay, and if you look closely, the two individuals at the end look like they're from European ancestry. The one in the middle looks more ethnic, like perhaps indigenous, maybe even of African ancestry. Okay, anything else? All right, so I'll let the cat out of the bag. It is Francis Swamp Fox Marion. Have any of you seen The Patriot? that um, character was based on this individual. And you really have like the South and the North being depicted uh, by looking at a um, palm tree and then like an oak tree on the other side. And it might be really representing like the trade that is taking place as well. But this is the only one that I couldn't find that second source. And this is a really good lesson for my kids so that they can identify that you have to corroborate evidence, especially when they do the document-based question, when we're looking at visual literacy. And by the way, we know that visual literacy is important across the curriculum, right? Not just for the AP kids. But the reality is that sometimes we might walk out of it not having 100% certainty that this is correct. 
All right, in the middle section, it really focuses on inventions and progress. We saw the sewing machine, we saw the steamship, and I would ask my kids at this point to try to identify. So the sewing machine, really, who gets credit for it? Singer, right? Although it was someone else that invented it before. Okay, how, right? What about the steamship? Especially we're talking about like the Fulton and the engine and why that would be good for trade and commerce. And we might talk about that for only a couple of seconds, right? But it's just like refreshing their memory. The plow and the reaper. And I think this is really important because a lot of our kids, at least I've always lived in an urban setting, and a lot of the kids really do not understand farming. They think it's just like a section of Publix. Um, <laughs> and, and the reality is that technology is also going to have this transformative impact in the rural sector of our country as well, and not just in the urban centers. The telegraph pole that we saw as well. And finally, you have the factory system. And who's that individual that we associate in American history with the factory system? And it's Slater, right? And then we're going to have the um, textile mills that would eventually be developed and so forth, and the market revolution that would really literally revolutionize um, the economic structure of our country. But what I want you to consider doing is this, and this is the project. So I had the idea of asking my students, well, what about a bicentennial vase? What if we are going to create, trying to emulate what Carl Mueller did all the way back in 1876 for this um, exhibition in Philadelphia to commemorate 100 years? What if I were to break you up into small groups and ask you to design and create a bicentennial vase that would commemorate from 1876 to 1976? Specifically, I want the students to recreate the middle and the bottom sections and to identify which president would be the most important one. You know, we know George Washington is the father of our nation, but from 1876 to 1976, who would you select? And what I really want you to think about is going to my argument here, my thesis that this is not mutually exclusive to preparing them for the AP examination, is that I'm really trying to get my kids to think about chronological reasoning, specifically periodization, what is happening from this year to this year, and I'm also going to ask them to think about changes and continuity. So I'm going to give you two minutes while I give you a handout of my written instructions that you can use with your kids if you decide to use this activity. I'm going to give you two minutes to come up with a list three things three things that um, you believe to be historically significant from 1876 to 1976 and three things that represent innovations or progress in our country okay so three and three and you have two minutes for that three historical significant events you get to discuss if you want in your table while I give you the instructions that you can use with your kids and I also want you to identify three examples of progress or innovations from the same time period. All right, because we have limited time and I want to make sure that we move on, I want you to think about how you're probably having this great discussion with your table, right? And this is what you want the kids to do in the classroom. So I would like to hear from one person from each table. Let's start with this one over here. Okay, so we were just having an interesting conversation. We wanted okay. to include Martin Luther King as a historical event. Okay. Uh, so we have um, Selma and we have the speech in Washington. Okay. And you know, the March on Washington. How do you pick which one of those to put on the vase? Okay. Clearly, you're not going to be able to put every single historical event, right? So this is really a good exercise to help kids to edit information as well. Oftentimes, they might just remember like a laundry list, but you need to have that discussion with them as to how do you prioritize what is really that transformative, maybe a turning point in our nation's history. I mean, if, okay? you look, if you looked at the, the first face, you had Native Americans in a nice position that didn't have wounded knee, it didn't have you know right. some massacre, uh -huh. right? So they're not going to show Selma, they're going to show Mark. Usually right. they right. teach Martin Luther King uh, prize, victory. Well, they only speech. teach in the class with Martin Luther King right. uh, uh, speaking in 1963. Right. They don't teach us mm -hmm. activism the last five years of his life. So, okay. 
Yeah, and that's an excellent point, right? If we're trying to commemorate, what is the purpose? Why are we creating this, okay? Yes? And even his stance, because there was a big controversy with the Martin Luther King Memorial a couple years back. Okay. You know, it, the one in Washington that was on the monument, uh -huh. on, the, on the mall, which is another thing you can teach, because in the AP language um, prompt a couple years ago about uh, <coughs> monuments, uh, students across the country didn't know the word mall, the mall capitalized, mm -hmm. and they were thinking about putting monuments in malls, shopping malls <laughs> across the nation. So it's cultural literacy. I am literacy. not surprised. But um, <laughs> the controversy was, um, the, they initially chose a Martin Luther King with his arms crossed, kind of frowning. And so even even like the how you space them, what you pick, which iconography you pick, I mean, the kids can have lots of discussions on this. Indeed. Very Back here. Well, none of us are history teachers. Okay. <laughs> so, so we settled on the moon landing. Okay. And oh, absolutely. Because mm -hmm. we yeah, thought that was a very important thing with uh -huh. the space race, and it really kind of could talk of a little China, bit like yeah. the defeat of the Soviets. Cold War, a Interesting bit, space and national pride, and Good. beat those Russians. And yeah, and it was one of those events where we actually were able to galvanize as a country, right, and get behind this particular initiative and make it happen. Okay, and this group? What did we have? Well, well we had some of them. Okay. okay. We about well, we had talked about, uh, which also ties into the Cold War, the Eisenhower Act of uh, the highway system, which then spread to the suburbs and everything else. Good, and that is something that then we can tie into the economic development and growth as well, not just the urban sprawl. The reality is that there's no right particular answer, right? It's how you're able to support that particular assertion, which is exactly what the kids have to do on the AP exam, right? They identify the historically significant evidence so that they can use that to substantiate whatever historically defensible claim they have established in their thesis statement. So I am glad that you were able to share all of these. Now I'm gonna tell you what my kids selected because I had them do this. And let's see if there's some overlap between what you said and what my kids did. That's what they selected for the historical scenes. I heard someone around here talk about the national parks. Okay, was that this group? That's something that some of my kids really value. They also saw World War I and II as turning point in our nation's history, right? Changing our foreign policy, particular events like D-Day when you're looking at the European theater of war, the civil rights movement, specifically my kids selected the I have a dream speech as opposed to Selma or anything else, and the moon landing that a lot of you also agreed with that. What about the innovations and progress? Because we really didn't get to talk a lot about that. We saw the telegraph pole. We saw the sewing machine. What would be? Couldn't the Panama been... Canal and moon landing also go into innovation mm -hmm. and progress? Okay. We could have used those there instead. Okay, so maybe we could have used that in here as well. Maybe with aviation and then even going into outer space. At least the spinoffs that came from the moon landing. Okay. okay. Microwaves. Anyone else? Microwaves. Okay. I know, that's the only way I know how to cook. So that, that is significant. We thought about assembly line. Uh -huh. The assembly line, Henry Ford, the automobile. Okay, what else? Computers. Computers. <laughs> Absolutely, all of those things. Now, before we continue, where do you think I send my kids for guidance so that they would know what would be the good content to select? I send them to the curriculum framework for the AP, and I send them to the Georgia Performance Standards so that they can see that this is what specifically you need to know. So that it's not just what Mr. Gregory thinks is historically significant, the microwave because I can't cook, <laughs> but because I am legally required to teach X, Y, and C. And what my students selected is this, okay? from the telephone, the automobile that some of you mentioned, radio and motion pictures, that's specifically stated in our state standards that we need to cover, television and mass media. This one I found really interesting as well, penicillin and medical advancements. Um, it's something that kind of like surprised me that that's what they selected. The personal computer as well. And what I like about this project is that I don't want, um, you know, 30 different bicentennial bosses, but I would break them into groups. And it's a really great opportunity for the students to also see 
how to compare and contrast your interpretation if you were to do one as opposed to that group and so forth and how there's a lot of overlap but there's also room for disagreement as to why you think this is more historically significant than something else. All right, so after they discuss their topics, they're going to create visual representations in index cards. So I will give them the four by six, and if you're going to do the I Have a Dream speech or the March on Washington, then that's what you're going to draw in that particular index card. Now, I work at a school for the performing arts, so I have some kids that are fairly talented when it comes to drawing. Um, but you could alternate the assignment. You could go ahead and instead of having them do that, they can just print the images, right? They can go ahead and get an image that represents that. They will select the topics and then put them in chronological order. Why? Because I want them to think about chronological reasoning. So if you're going from the Panama Canal all the way to the moon landing, I want to make sure that every single item that you selected is going to be in the right order, okay? In addition to that, I want them to select the president. And who did you pick? So I would like to know from each group, which president did you select out of all of the wonderful options that we had and currently have? Um, any group that wants to go first? FDR. 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 <laughs> Why FDR? So many initiatives came in during the Great Depression with the TBA and everything else that it still has a huge imprint on our lives. Okay. Leadership during World War II. Leadership during World War II. The only one that has served like four terms, although he didn't finish the fourth one. <laughs> Conversely, you might have someone else that will say, well, that's really <laughs> the culprit for the creation of the welfare state, and it's really perhaps not the best. And do you see how that's going to have this great Ronald Reagan? For your group? Well, no, no. no? <laughs> that kid would answer Ronald Reagan. Right. Be yeah. There's plenty of kids. That would Absolutely. What about it? Did you select FDR? FDR. Okay. We thought FDR. We also thought Kennedy is kind of representing the transition from the old to the new. And okay. Kennedy gave a great speech. He died. <laughs> Kennedy gets right. And right. the assassination, of course, impacted okay. um, the world. Okay. Anyone else who wants to share a final observation before I show you? the sample that was created by my kids? Okay, well I know whenever I do a workshop presentation or whenever I have an activity after school with my kids that if you bring candy or snacks, they think highly of you. <laughs> but I did not do that for you today, so I do apologize <laughs> for misleading you. But this is the project that they did, okay? I'm gonna pass this around. What they selected for technological innovations and progress the first one dealt with um, transportation. So they did kind of like the evolution from railroads to the automobile and Henry Ford to aviation. Okay, and that was one. For the second one, they selected communications and they did the evolution as well from the radio to the television to the personal computer, which a lot of you already mentioned. and. The final one that was the one that surprised me a bit is the one with medicine. So they went ahead and they selected penicillin, then heart transplants and like HIV and cancer research in the present day. Now, as far as the historical scenes that they selected, and again, they had to go in chronological order. They started with Teddy Roosevelt, first modern president, building the Panama Canal with the big stick as a foreign policy. They're so much more creative than I could ever be. World War I, which is a transformative point as far as our foreign policy is concerned, going back to George Washington and the Farewell Address. Then you have D-Day, right? Um, turning point in the European theater of the war, going back to what this table identified, the I Have a Dream speech during the civil rights movement. And finally, something that a lot of you agreed with is the moon landing. This actually kind of like surprised me because we don't spend a lot of time on it. Uh, but for some reason, the kids really uh, remember this. And they had been watching during the year The Astronaut Wives. So that was like a mini series this past okay. year. <laughs> and they're like, yeah, that's a really cool one. And you might be surprised that they selected for the president FDR. Okay? So they went ahead, and no shocker there, right? But I also want to go back to. Um, alternate assignments that you may want to do in a couple of minutes. 
in addition to creating something like this, and by the way, this is just like where I have my breakfast every morning, it's just in the oatmeal <laughs> container, so you can pick any type of container. They have to write a description that explains the significance, okay? In addition to that, they have to create a timeline that identifies the top three continuities and the top three changes from that time period, from 1876 to 1976. And I have that in the rubric that I shared with you. But I also want you to think about two other assignments that you may want to do with this. Number one is different perspectives. I'm going to give you just one minute instead of two, um, unlike the other time around. And I want you to think about things that are perhaps not high points in our nation's history. If you were not going to commemorate the bicentennial, if you were going to think about a moment in American history where maybe we didn't live up to our principles or where some people find questionable that we kind of like dropped the ball or that someone might have a different perspective on that and how that would really change the way that this piece of art would look. So take about a minute to identify that and then also try to identify just one. I just want one example, not three, and go back so that you could synthesize. <laughs> I like saying that. Try to go back to a different time period. If you are creating the one that Carl Mueller created from 1776 to 1876, what is something that he left out that you were left scratching your head perhaps thinking, why didn't he include that during the first 100 years? So take a minute to identify those two things, please. All right, in the interest of not going over by much longer, um, if we can do a quick share out, who would like to go first and identify uh, maybe one thing from the left or the right? Yes. All right, now one, one of them, this is the, uh, when we talk about the buffalo, I mean, I was shocked when I saw the buffalo downstairs that they were honoring it because they massacred it. Okay. So, so they massacred all the buffalo oh so they would so they would mm, kill the African, the, um, so they would uh, fire drive the Native Americans off. Right. So here they are. If you kill the, the buffalo, buffalo you kill the Native American, right? Okay, who can give me another example? Full Connor, hoses and dogs. Yeah, okay. Third and final example? Watergate. Watergate. Well, this is what my kids selected, okay? From the Chinese Exclusion Act to the Wounded Knee, Plessy versus Ferguson, American imperialism, the Ku Klux Klan, the Japanese internment camps, the atomic bombs, Korea and Vietnam, the first and second Red Scares, the stormy 1960s, and Watergate. And what I decided to do instead of creating another one is that they did those index cards, and those are inside this container because inside of our nation's history and narrative, oftentimes we do have a dark side or a side that oftentimes people may not want to necessarily teach, right? And you can see that that's what they went ahead and created. So there is Wounded Knee, Plessy versus Ferguson, and you can see those later on um, in the interest of time. Comparing it to Mueller and what he did with the first century, I heard a lot of you mention, like, how can he not talk about the Civil War? Well, if you're trying to commemorate the country, right, that may not be something that you may want to select, right? Or maybe the fact that we did overcome that, okay? Maybe. Exactly. And the last thing to conclude is, so what, as far as the AP exam is concerned? Well, we know that every single multiple choice question is going to be based on some type of stimulus, um, including visuals. And a lot of kids struggle, not perhaps as much with political cartoons, but with quantitative data, like charts and graphs, and you really need to expose them to that. They also need to interpret maps. A lot of the short answers will require that they also have this particular set of skills. And the DBQ, obviously, where you normally would have one to two documents out of the seven that would be some type of visual. So as you get to see those around, please keep in mind that it's about the historical thinking skill, not just the content, that is really transferable whether you're using it in the AP classroom or in a non-level class, okay? Thank you, any questions?